In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. A series of two local events were held in South Dakota, in Lemon and Fort Pier. Uh, I'm, I'm with the Dakota Lakes Research Farm with South Dakota State University. It's one of the research farms they have. It's different from... Uh, most is owned by farmers, which is really important, and I have an 11-member board of directors that <clears throat> I work with, and my phone is set to be on silent except for one of the board calls, and one of the board guys called this morning, and it, it went on loud. But this is our main station. It's uh, uh, right along the Missouri River, which is important. You can see we've got some rough ground there uh, to the north of us that we don't own, and we have some Opal Promise ground up to the north, which is the kind of West River soils, and you guys, uh, and actually the, the north side of our farm is, is uh, heavy, heavy clay soils as well, and this stuff down by the river is pretty good. But, so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is, is stuff that we've done, and then this idea of, of, of diverse no-till rotations and whatever. Uh, they hired a new director for the West River Ag Center, which would be the people that serve you, and her name is Christy Kamak, and she's going to start in July, I believe. And she's originally from Platt, and she's married to uh, uh, one of the Kamaks from Union Center, so I think she'll probably hang around for a while. But in the process of interviewing her, one of the things we're trying to assess is how, how she planned to uh, determine where to take the research program, which is really important. And one of the things that I discussed with her was the fact that in 1985, if we had asked everybody in central South Dakota what they needed, there's not one person that said we need diverse no-till rotations. So you can't necessarily go out and just ask people what they need. Sometimes you and the university people together have to start trying to figure out where the heck you're going to be in the next number of years, and at Hag Horizons, I talked about planning for 600 years in the future, because that helps you. And, and one of the things I talked about is we will not be irrigating out of the Missouri River in 50 or 60 years, because that will be filled with silt. So we won't be doing that. We're not planning on being able to do that. We're going to have to have a different plan if we're going to do anything with irrigation, which we don't do a lot. This is all dry land here, and the stuff up north is all dry land. And one of the things that really drove my thinking there to a certain extent, and the fact that I wanted to talk about is Ruth and I had the chance to spend a few weeks in France and England this, this winter and actually uh, talking to farmers and go, staying with farmers and you know, whatever. It was really more of a, a farmer to farmer thing. We had our own car with an English speaking GPS. The way we, <laughs> the way we went, you know, and we, and we learned all the French swear words because of the mistakes we made. So we learned a lot of French swear words. That's the only, in French gestures, which some of those are the same as here. But <clears throat> every, every city you went to, they wanted to show you their castle. Everybody had a castle that somebody built four, five, six, seven hundred years ago. And they'd show you the castle and they'd say, well, this is where they stored all the grain. And I said, well, where did they grow the grain? Well, around the castle. And you look at the soil around the castle and it looked like this. You go, well, God, you know, there, that's, that's actually soil, I believe. That's not snow up there. That's just soil that's been eroded to the point that it's, it's just nothing there, and they're working on getting this the same down here, if they can. <clears throat> in every place they did lots of tillage, right? And, and one of the things I said to them is that, you know, my ancestors and your ancestors, most of you, left Europe to come to the United States so they could mine soils here because the soils there were so degraded they no longer could support the community. And we've only been here 100, 150 years, and we've done a pretty good job of it. And only recently have we started to rethink how we're doing things, okay? So we saw a lot of, <laughs> a lot of really 
crappy soils, right? Uh, <clears throat> and lots of tillage. So that makes me emphasize that short-term studies are not, in, not accurate in evaluating treatments such as tillage or rotations which have long-term impacts. But we really don't have the choice to continue to do tillage because it just degrades, degrades the soil. So let's look at it a different way. A farmer manages ecosystems and takes sunlight, uh, water, and carbon dioxide and makes them into products to be sold. You know, we're not really wheat growers or lentil growers or whatever. We just, whatever somebody wants, if we can grow it, we should be growing it in, a, in an environmental way. And a lot of what we do in the United States is we grow corn and soybean to haul to feedlots to feed to, to feed the cattle. If we want cattle, we should just grow cattle and figure out how to do beef without all these intermediate steps. And one of the questions I asked the candidates that were interviewing for the West River Ag Center, I said, do you think there'll be feedlots in 50 years? And the <coughs> response was this and this and this and this. And I kept looking at them, and finally, both of the finalists that were in the hunt, one of them said no, and one of them said probably not. Because of E. coli and animal rights and nutrient movement and all these things that are wrong with having animals in confinement, which you can really see if you go to Europe and you can see if you go to other parts of the United States, not so much at Lemon. So, <clears throat> Let's look at what we have to do to mimic natural processes. Water cycle, energy flow, mineral cycle, and community dynamics. A lot of people are talking about cover crops, but cover crops are just tools. No-till is a tool to help us manage our ecosystem. What you're doing is you're managing an ecosystem out there, your farm ground, whether it's grass or farm ground or mixed farm ground and grass, whatever. Does the rain feed plants and recharge your groundwater, or does it run off and cause erosion and water quality degradation? We had a, a, a Ray Archuleta came to visit the farm. We had a little hoo-ha there this summer. And we went up in, to our north unit, the heavy soils, the opal soils, and did some infiltration stuff on our ground. And then right across the fence in, in grassland, it, somebody is grazing. Huge difference. Our ground took the water in. The grazed ground didn't because a guy grazed it poorly. Just because you're grazing doesn't mean you're optimizing that ecosystem. Okay? So it, <clears throat> it makes a difference. What happens on your place? The Colex Research Farm began to use diverse low disturbance no-till and cover cropping to co control runoff from center pivots. We were started by a group of irrigators. This is at Gettysburg. They'd pump the water out of the river, bring it up, and run right back to the river. <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense, and it costs a lot of money, and, and it's a real water quality issue. Okay? We now will put on nine, uh, two inches of water in nine minutes, and some of you have been there when we've done this. And we'll walk right behind those irrigators and you won't get your feet muddy because we have that kind of soil structure. Once we have that kind of soil structure, now we, we think we can start really doing the grazing, integrating the grazing thing well, okay? Uh, <clears throat> we have surface cover. We have macropores. These macropores take water and This is Eileen Cladifco from Purdue that <clears throat> she pours latex kind of real kind of rubber, liquid rubber stuff, and then it goes down in holes, and then when it, when it solidifies, she digs, digs it out, and that's what the soil would look like there. Not like a fun job to do. Uh, some people use dye and shows you how the water goes in the ground. It doesn't soak in uniformly everywhere. It goes in holes. And if you keep those holes open to the surface, they're a function. If you close them, they don't. So if I take a vertical tillage tool, which everybody seems to really think is a good deal, and run across my no-till field, it'll cut the infiltration rate in half. That's not what you want to do, and it'll cause all the weeds to grow. So we don't want to do that kind of stuff. Energy flow, how much sunlight strikes green leaves and makes food for the ecosystem, and how much falls on dead vegetation and bare ground? Think of the old wheat summer fallow program. What percentage of the year did you catch the sunlight? <laughs> Not very damn much, 
right, out of the two years. Okay? We weren't doing a good job of harvesting sunlight, and that's really what it's all about is harvesting sunlight. So again, that's, if you're going to do cover crops, that's the thing you do with a cover crop is you use that as a, as a tool. The Dakota Lakes Research Farm uses cover and forage crops to fine tune our crop rotations. They're just part of a crop rotation. And we want to increase this carbon capture because you don't increase organic matter without having some carbon to put in there. And you'll hear a lot of stuff about cover crops, high carbon nitrogen ratios and whatever. And a lot of people are telling you, well, you really don't want to have a high carbon and nitrogen rotation because you want the nitrogen to, to, to get the nitrogen and release it for your crop. But if you do that, you're really mining the organic matter. And we're really finding that we've got a really pump, biggest limiting factor in ecosystems is carbon. Not all these other things you hear about, carbon. So we're going to increase the carbon capture, then that sequesters nutrients and we fix the nitrogen. You don't fix nitrogen into your soil without having carbon to go with it, okay? And also encourage our friendlies, what Stan Forge calls friendlies, or beneficial insects. <clears throat> now, part of the things we work on is ways to make the cover crop thing work better. If you wait until you harvest at Lemon and at Pier, until you harvest wheat and then try to get a cover crop in and get it grow and get any size to it, it's pretty hard. So we're putting a lot of effort into trying to do things like clay seed balls. These are seeds in, in clothes and little balls of clay and peat and in this case, I think cow manure, <laughs> which is a good binding agent actually. I had a German intern that was really gung-ho and I told him one day, well, if you put some cow manure in there, that, that ball would stay together better. And next thing I know, he's across the road following and you know, looking for patties to grind up and stick in there. So we gave him an A for effort. He was, uh, uh, <clears throat> crop rotation allows time for natural enemies to destroy pathogens. One crop while an un unrelated crop is grown. We've known about crop rotations forever. We don't like to use them, but <clears throat> they're our best tool. And that's the thing we've done a lot of work on and I've got lots of stuff and we're going to cover a little bit on crop rotations. But sequence is only one component of a crop rotation. Sequence is if you put uh, peas behind wheat, that's just one part. But what do you do the rest of the time? And in the United States, we got a lot of people doing corn, soybean, corn, soybean, corn, soybean. That's like a two crop monoculture. It's very predictable. And that's why they're having all these resistance problems. And then you go to North Dakota and Canada and they do wheat, lentil, wheat, lentil, wheat, lentil, wheat, lentil, right? I mean, it's like, uh, okay, guys, it, every other year is not the right thing. So crop rotation, proper intensity. Use the water you get. Now, here you can not do what they do in Iowa or Illinois, but if, if, if you don't use the water you get, you're going to get saline seeps and those kind of things. And one of the bad things that happened with no-till was people with no-till not change their intensity and the water went in the ground better and it just increased the amount of saline seeps, which wasn't a good thing because they hadn't cranked up intensity. Uh, adequate diversity. I was talking to a guy this morning, one of the farmers that I work with, or my neighbor actually, and he grows a lot of field peas and he's trying to figure out where he's going to grow, you know, if he should grow a whole bunch of lentils too. And I just told him, you can't have too many crops. If you're growing both peas and lentils, you've got to sell peas and you've got to sell lentils and they're not that much different. Are you ready to have more grain bins? Because you've got to have more grain bins because you can't just take those to the elevator. Uh, <clears throat> if you get this stuff done, then you get your stable, sustainable profitability. Native vegetation is the best indicator of range the range of intensities that are appropriate for a lo location. And Ruth will tell you, <laughs> as we drive down the road, I'm always talking about native, what, what the native vegetation is. And I've got three daughters that are so sick and tired of hearing about native vegetation. <clears throat> they're all successfully off to college and they're happy they don't have to hear about that anymore. But most of the problem we've had on no, that blamed on no-till are resolved of not having enough diversity or not having enough intensity. And, and you've got to look at those things first. Put the water you save to work. 
by using more high water use crops and cover crops or double crops and getting a, a, a fine tuning. You don't have enough time between wheat harvest and fall and enough moisture in wheat harvest and fall to grow another grain crop, but you can grow a cover crop. And I used to call these forage crops. I was doing this when I was still at Redfield before I ever went to Pier. So in the 80s, we were doing this kind of stuff because we had livestock at Redfield and we'd use them for forage crops. Uh, <clears throat> and now we're getting livestock again. Proper intensity reduces the risk. Are the nutrients available for plant use or environmental services or have they been leached, eroded, or transported from the landscape? Well, <clears throat> ecosystems that leak nutrients become deserts. That's kind of what's happened in parts of Europe. You can see that in the soils. They're about ready to become deserts. Parts of Africa, desertation. Saline seeps in indicate leak leakage. What's in a saline seep? Salt. Everybody says salt, right? <clears throat> Darren Hefty said that to me one day. And I asked him that question. And I said, that's fine. What kind of salts? If you're taking chemistry in high school, I, I taught chemistry, so that, not ag, I taught chemistry and physics. So <clears throat> you take an acid base, you make a salt. There's lots of different salts. What kind of salts would be in most saline seeps? The number one in most of South Dakota would be some form of nitrate, calcium nitrate or whatever. The nitrate fertilizer you put on go to the saline seep if, they don't if you don't use it. Okay, so the stuff you don't use gets leached down and goes sideways. Number two is calcium carbonate, lime. So that question came up earlier today, should you be putting lime on? If you're dropping your pH, and have to start using lime at Lemon, South Dakota, you don't have enough intensity. You, you're, you're leaching. Now, if you've ever dug a post hole, and everybody in here has, that white stuff you find about this to this deep is what, Sarah? Yeah, calcium carbonate, lime. And the way they know that when they're doing tests is they put a little acid on. If it fizzes, it's lime. If it doesn't fizz, what is it? No, it's gypsum, calcium sulfate, the other one, see? So if those things are down there, you need to get a root down there, bring it back to the surface. And your annual crops, if all you're doing is wheat and stuff, it's going to get away from you. You need the deeper roots, or you do what Grandpa used to do, and you put in the perennials, perennial grasses, and bring it and graze it, and bring it back up the surface and deposit on the surface, right? So if somebody tells you what's in the saline seep, say fertilizer. So the kids that go to Votech and Watertown have been trained now because they've come to visit me. And if they say anything other than fertilizer, I just give them all kinds of help. So they get warned before they come there. Don't, he asks you this question. So decreasing pH indicates leakage because your lime's going away. One unit train of soybeans contains a million pounds of phosphorus. The other way you can leak nutrients is you send them to China or Taiwan, or India, or Arkansas, all those foreign countries. <laughs> so rainfall comes in, goes down, comes across. It, if you don't pull that back up and hold it up here, it gets washed away. Cover and forage crops provide opportunity to increase both your intensity and diversity in a situation where you can't produce another crop or it wouldn't be but that wouldn't be possible. It would be unprofitable. It would be extremely risky because you use too much, uh, don't have enough time or whatever. In human environments, these tall grass prairies are wetter. The goal should be to have something growing at all times. That's not necessarily you guys. In areas with limited growing season, this will require the use of cover crops or forage double crops. But wet, wet areas, wetter areas. In subhuman, semi-arid, and arid areas, like we are and you are, environment cover crops can be utilized to increase organic matter and biological activity. They're just fine tuning. But it's not like we're going to use them like the guys do in Illinois and Indiana and whatever. I like to use a thing that a, a kid in, or a kid probably 45, in, <laughs> in, in North Dakota used one day and I stole it. I said, I need the South Dakota rights and I'm, I'm still far enough 
away from North Dakota, I can use it. Catch and release nutrients. That's really what you're trying to do. And I said carbon is, ecosystems are carbon limited, right? <clears throat> you guys, if I ask you what, what, what limited ecosystem, what would you be most likely to have told me if I went and told you the answer? Nitrogen. Everybody worries about nitrogen. Okay? So in this room, how many parts per million of carbon dioxide do we have? 400, maybe a little more, right? Because we're all breathing, right? 400 parts per million. Outside, we might be 320. Used to be 250 or something, right? But we've raised that with plowing and, and using fossil fuels. And up until, what was it, the 1940 or 50, most of the CO2 that man caused came from tillage from the soil. And then it started to switch over and used to be, to be fossil fuel. But still, tillage causes a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. But still, we're looking at about 400 parts per million. How many parts per million in the atmosphere of nitrogen? 800,000 800, parts per million, right? 80% or 70%, 78%, 780,000 parts per million. So there's really no shortage of nitrogen. We just got to get the nitrogen from here into the ground, and the plants do that with the microorganisms. The limiting thing is carbon to give them the energy to do that, okay? And that's really what we're talking about. Catch the sunlight, use that sunlight energy to put it in there. So here's us catching and releasing nutrients, and this is a mixture of oats and hay millet that was swathed <coughs> right after I took this picture. But you can see how big it is. This is my pick up. So we had a nice stand of hay millet and oats and we swathed it and the oats would regrow uh, after that. Uh, this is our cows grazing. Here's a hot wire. This would turn them in. They're eating the regrowth on the oats and the winter wheat that was in there. And then also you can see the swaths kind of coming across. Um, can't see it real well there. You can see just the remnants of the swath going up. They eat all the green stuff and then they start eating the the swath, and then, <clears throat> then we'll move the wire when the swath gets cleaned up. And, and if you walked on that today, there's, there's nothing there in terms of loose stuff, but all this long stuff and the wheat straw is all still there. Because we don't let them sit and camp and hammer it, we're constantly moving them. And one of our big <clears throat> initiatives is we're going to try to make a self-propelled grazing cell where we can actually just have this mobile thing that I can move and whatever. I was listening to all the guys this morning going, yeah, I feed cows and wind was blowing it away and whatever. Well, I fed my cows this morning because they're just out there. And we move them every three days. We don't have the self-propelled grazing cell yet, but they're out there and we move them every three days. We just move that wire. We've got them on corn stalks right now. We had 12 inches of, 10 to 12 inches of snow. And, and where we have the cows just, we have eight groups of cows. Four of them, <coughs> four of them have, a field they just have, and they'll have that for 48 days, and then four of the groups are moved every three days. Well, where the snow was, they, they're, these guys are getting pretty hungry because they're, they're, a lot of snow is covering things. And same time I took that picture, this is the ones, this is the group that's moving. And they're about ready to move, but they're, because they're concentrated in a little narrow area, there's a lot more hoof action and the residue Snow gets trampled through the residue and they have more access to the residue. It's kind of a interesting. I didn't think of that when we started doing this. Uh, <clears throat> what we did yesterday is we took a drone and flew, flew over those fields taking pictures and infrareds and whatever. This is teff grass in the back here, but uh, we flew over them so we can see the patterns of grazing, what's happened in the different things, and because we're halfway through. And it has to be over 40 degrees for him to fly. So we did it yesterday. Saturday we'll be halfway through and then and then <clears throat> so we half the ground in those strip, the ones that are moving, half of it's not been grazed yet. Uh, <clears throat> catch and release, here's an experiment we did several years ago. We had some irrigated corn, grew cover crops, uh, uh, lentil, uh, chickling vetch, which is grass pea, turnip, uh, 
peas, that kind of stuff, after weed harvest going to corn the next year. And then we had a yield goal of 220 bushel the acre. We put on no nitrogen, got 176. We put on 36 pounds an acre and got 236, 72 pounds, no difference, 214, 233. How do we predict that? I don't know. One of the nice things about living at Lemon, South Dakota, if you use a nitrate soil test, and you over apply your nitrogen, it'll be there next year and you'll get it in your soil test and you can use it next year. If you lived in Iowa or someplace and you had drain tile, it would all go in the drain tile and go in the Mississippi River and be gone. Okay? So one of the nice things here in North Dakota, South Dakota, you can, you can use the nitrate soil test works really well. Right? And if you want to know whether you can really take that nitrogen credit for long-term no-till or not, you can't in South Dakota, but if you go across the border in North Dakota, you can take a, was it 40, John, or 50 pounds? 50 pounds an acre if for long-term no-till, you take that nitrogen credit. So, depends, <laughs> you know, what the hell. <laughs> I thought that, I was thinking of the railroad tracks here, you know, and going, yeah, okay, we can do that. <clears throat> and people used to say, well, if I no-till, if I no-till, then I'm, it's too wet and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you get stranded in the rain in the back 40, you drive home across the field or the pasture, tilled field or pasture. You drive home across the pasture. And so once you get the soil structure, I mean, what, the problem with soupy wet soils and stuff in no-till is that first trying to get the soil structure back into that ground. And same way with cows. Trampling, you, you, you know, that picture I showed you of the corn stalks, those cows hadn't mudded up that field at all. Twelve inches of snow and it melted and, you know, they're, they're penetrating just about this far, a little bit in places. But if I have them camping there and just turn the cows out to where we just turn them out and going to come back and get them 48 days, we're going to get, we're getting trails. And we're getting areas around the tanks that are tore up. <clears throat> Weeds and diseases, nature's way of adding diversity to system lacks diversity, so you, you <clears throat> you, you battle weeds by having diverse rotations and having lots of competition. And we have lots of guys out doing cover crops and they reduce, they reduce their weed pressure a lot because if, if you're not growing something out there, the weed will go, okay, if you're not going to use that ground, I will. <laughs> right? That's kind of what happens. But if you can have a cover crop out there, you won't have the weeds. And, and in France, they're doing a lot of stuff with cover crops now. My good friend, Frederick, uh, <clears throat> that had us over there, they're doing a lot of with cover crops, thinking that's the way that they're going to get the guys to quit doing tillage. Because they get them growing cover crops, see the benefit of that, and then they don't have time to do all their dang tillage. Um, <laughs> well, well it's, it's working kind of, you know, it's kind of interesting. But we're going to, you know, we're going to take care of it by adding. We want to see at least three crop types, long intervals of two to four years are needed to break some disease and weed cycle. We're not afraid of resistant weeds. That's a big talk in the Corn Belt, is all these resistant weeds. It doesn't scare us a bit. Uh, <clears throat> that, there's also a benefit to yield. And I show this because the Wheat Commission is fun. You know, Reed is here, and so I'm going to beat that drum a little bit. The Wheat Commission of all the commissions has the best, been the best one at funding all of the research we've done on these systems. I think John Rickardson, who's now in North Dakota that came from South Dakota, would agree. So here's an old study that we did years ago on <clears throat> different rotations with all with no-till. Alternate year wheat, if we did wheat fallow, wheat pea, wheat flax, these are all, all every other year wheat things. We had 46 bushel wheat. Two years out of wheat is wheat corn, pea, wheat corn, flax, wheat corn, that uh, fallow, that same thing. We picked up seven, roughly seven, six, seven bushels. Uh, <clears throat> By, by just having that extra year. And then we did a rotation. We had spring with winter wheat corn and then this broadleaf. And we did that. We did that because of the farm program at the time for all you young guys. You had to try to keep a 50% wheat base. If you're wheat fallow, if you didn't keep your 50% wheat base, you lost money on the program. But if you're going to do half wheat, you're better off to do two wheats and two out versus every other year. So a guy in the corn belt would be better off doing corn, corn, soybean, soybean. Now the problem with corn, corn, soybean, soybean, or corn, soybean, or wheat, canola, those kind of things is there's not enough carbon. What's your native vegetation here? How many percent grass? 
90, 95% grasses, and you go out there and put in a rotation that's half grass and think you're, no, you got to have more carbon in there. Our best rotation right now that we are working with on the farm, we have wheat, wheat, sorghum corn or corn, corn, and then one broadleaf, 80% high residue. And it just blows things away because now we're getting in more stuff. In terms of money, I showed this, this, <clears throat> this to the guys. This is numbers from back then. They're pretty good numbers now. If I can grow wheat for <clears throat> 245, I'm okay. Okay. Uh, wheat fallow 460. Wheat corn fallow 379. Wheat corn pea 245. But I had a guy one day say, "Well, can you make any money in them damn peas?" And I said, "Don't have to make money on peas. I just have to lose the less money, and it costs me to do summer fallow." Right? So that's part of the, <clears throat> what you think about when you do rotation. We've got a lot of guys calling now wanting to grow lentils because that's the only thing that's worth anything. If everybody that calls me grows lentils, they won't be worth anything next year. <laughs> and I keep telling them that, you know, like, it's inelastic demand. As soon as they get the last lentil they need, they're not worth anything. They're five cent a pound pig feed. Right? <clears throat> Weeds. We can use cheat grass or whatever here for the weed, but what this is saying is we got, we got 10 weeds per acre, each has 100 seeds that are going to grow the next year. What happens if we use different rotation? Okay, well if I have every other year wheat, fallow, whatever, and I have 10 weeds and whatever, in, in year 7, this is year 7, I guess that didn't pop up, uh, year 7 we have 10 million of them. Okay. If I do wheat corn fallow or wheat corn pea or whatever, it, it never does blow up. If I'm going to do every other year something, I'm better off doing wheat, wheat, corn, broadleaf in that case, then it, it takes about 13 years for it to get to be a problem. And you can use that with water, hemp, or anything else. If, if you do continuous, and what the guys in the corn belt are doing is corn soybeans with Roundup Ready, they blow up in three years because they're using Roundup same time, okay, all time. This is winter wheat that we seeded where I, <clears throat> my ought to steer didn't work well. I ought to steer better than that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but no herbicide. It's normal for us to not really have to put herbicide on winter wheat. Uh, so we want diversity in seed, date, rooting pattern, root architecture, residue insects, uh, microorganisms, Harvest date beneficial. Um, so simple rotations: wheat, corn, fallow, wheat, corn, canola. This is what you think of as a rotation: corn, soybeans. And what it is is it's simple. The corn, the wheat, always goes to corn, always goes to fallow. It's easy if you have a hired man, right? You go well. All the all the wheat stuff is going to go to corn, so that's where you go put your spray on, right? Or or the guys from the co-op. You don't have to worry about them getting in the wrong wrong field, but. Uh, it's simple, simple, limited number of crops to manage the mar market. The problem is we're, we're consistent in both sequence and interval. The, the corn is always behind wheat and all the winter wheat's into spring wheat and whatever. So if you have something that's going to be a problem, it's a problem everywhere. Okay. Rotations with perennial sequences are really good. You can do short, stupid rotations for about six years and then you start getting trouble and then you go off to a perennial. And you kind of hit the reset button, and then you come back and do this again. And there, you, that works really well. Now, one of the problems with this, if you take that alfalfa off as hay and haul it away and don't put manure and stuff back there, it's the most degrading thing you can do to a piece of ground. Everybody thinks alfalfa is great for soils. If you take, alf if you take the alfalfa off, taking all the nutrients, all the carbon, not bringing it back. If you're grazing it, it's different. Same way if you're taking it off hay, grass hay, and doing the same thing, taking it off. Very, very degrading. So our north unit was hay for probably 60 years before we bought it. It was an incredibly degraded piece of opal promise soil. And we now have it, so it's, it's functioning. Okay? But there's a limited number of annual crops to manage your market. That's an advantage. Excellent place to spread manure. 
uh, on the perennial because the weeds don't have the annual weeds don't have much of a chance. Probably can produce more soil structure when you're using grass uh, and grass mixtures, grass seed. My father used to we grew grass seed. That was our perennial thing. We had livestock, and we grew grass seed, and then we grazed grazed the aftermath. Uh, biomass crops may hold potential if you're going to make ethanol out of biomass. It should be out of perennial grasses, not out of corn stalks. Okay. Uh, difficult to manage sufficient percentage of land and perennial crop without grazing. Uh, <clears throat> using less perennial minimizes the impact unless you have diverse rotations and perennial, then it works pretty good. Compound rotations where we do a little bit of both spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, soybean. Half, I call this my mother in law rotation. Half the corns and wheat stubble, half the corns and soybeans. So if your mother-in-law or your banker shows up in June, you're over in east, further east of here, mother-in-law shows up in June, you show her the corn that was planted into soybeans because it's nice and big and looks great. And they show up in August or early September, you show them the stuff that was in wheat stubble. Right? <laughs> it spreads your risk. In a wet year, the stuff behind beans makes you lots of money. That high-risk corn makes you a lot of money. And with a crop insurance, you, sometimes it makes sense to take advantage of them. I don't know. Uh, still have the same number of limited crops to manage, but we create a new sequence for some crop types. In the eastern corn belt, we have a corn rootworm that flies from the corn fields to soybean fields to lay their eggs. Because they know that the dumb guys in the eastern corn belt is going to plant his corn there. You know, I call that the blonde, sir. I call that the blonde corn rootworm beetle. Yeah. Because everybody thinks it's dumb, but it's really smart. Did I get my way out of that one? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> because they get the, in, in, in the Western Corn Belt, when we do this, we get the extended dipause corn root beetle where the eggs don't hatch for two years. So that's why everybody has to use BT <clears throat> every year on corn, even if they're rotating, because the bugs have gotten smarter than, than the farmers <clears throat> in the Corn Belt. Rotations where, with complex rotation where we use some barley instead of all wheat. Uh, instead of spring wheat, we have barley or oats. Uh, we have corn, sunflower, millet, and pea. There's still uh, millet or sorghum and corn. Uh, we're starting to grow a lot of sorghum in parts of South Dakota now because it breaks up a lot of the corn diseases and in insects. And it's more drought tolerant. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> so we can do a lot of things with those. And I've got a paper on this, so I'm going fast. You can just go on my website or email me and we'll send it to you. Okay. And then the stacked rotation where we do wheat, wheat, corn, corn, soybean, soybean. If you think of that corn rootworm beetle that flew from the corn field to the soybean field to lay her eggs, that's fine. That works in this field, but then you screw her up here, right? because it's not going to go back, and, and this one's not going to go back to corn, it's going to go to soybeans, so she's screwed up there, she's screwed up here because it's going to go to wheat. You've broken that habit. So even though it looks less diverse to us, it's more diverse to them, and the other thing it does do is it gives us a place to use long residual herbicides. So I talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> long breaks are, are great for doing some things that it, if you do a long break without using the same crop two times in a row, that's even better. So sorghum corn is a great <coughs> stack sequence. So we attempt to keep the past population diverse or confused, mix the long and short residual herbicide programs. Uh, it reduces the risk of developing this biotype resistance. I say here it's not well tested. We've been doing it long enough now that I'm getting a lot of confidence in it. The goal is to be inconsistent in both sequence and interval. So here's some other rotations that we use for different things. I use this. I, we don't use this one. There's a guy in Kansas that used that, and the Kansas people were telling me about it one day. Go, we got a dummy. He goes, wait, 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 until he gets goat grass, and he goes, sorghum, 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 until he gets shatter cane. Then he goes, sunflower, sunflowers, until he gets <coughs> sclerotinia. And, and they said, oh, what a dummy. And I said, he's not as dumb as a guy that does corn, soybean, corn, soybean, corn, soybean. At least he's responding to what's going on. So there's, there's some that we use. Um, all of them have, have a place. But there's no set recipe or best rotation. Individual fields need different treatments 
due to soils, location, proximity, history, landlord, and ownership. Does it make a difference how much carbon you have? Yeah. Here's uh, one of our rotations where we have every other year uh, broadleaf crops. It's low in carbon. This was uh, corn, soybean, pea, winter wheat. Both of these fields of winter wheat followed uh, pea. Both of these fields of winter wheat followed corn. The only difference here is over about a 12-year period, we had an extra low residue crop in there. And the yields... <coughs> Uh, 60 versus 29 when we had 7.9 inches of rain in 12 months. Uh, 92 versus 57 when we had a high rainfall year and 56 versus 28 when we had a low rainfall year. So this rotation here this year will switch and it'll just be <coughs> winter wheat corn pea again and this, this field here will go into perennial grass. So that's how we're going to fix that. Okay. Uh, <coughs> with that, I think I'll quit. Ruth, is it lunchtime? Yeah. Oh, I got a couple minutes? Okay. Uh, here's our irrigated stuff, which <clears throat> isn't as much interest to you, but it shows you that the guys in the corn belt are, are not looking correctly at their situation. On our irrigated ground, we do have, <clears throat> excuse me, one field that's corn, soybean. Has been since 1990. All of our rotations have run since 1990, which when I have college kids come out and we show them what we're doing, I remind them that we started doing this before they were born. <laughs> it was scary as hell. But anyway, uh, corn, soybean, if we use a cover crop in there, we get 7.3 bushels to the cover crop versus no cover crop. If we put a cover crop behind the corn going to soybean. In 2013, soybeans with <coughs> cover crop 62.9, we would have uh, accepted about 55.6 without the cover crop. We didn't do that without the cover crop. Uh, we have a rotation that's corn, corn. <clears throat> soybean, wheat, soybean, and here's where we had that big cover crop I showed you we were grazing with the cows, the hay millet and the oats and whatever. It gave us an opportunity to do all that grazing in there. But, it does, but this was before we were doing the grazing. The first year so soybeans don't have a cover crop in this, in this instance right here. We don't do a cover crop there. 73.6 uh, bushels, second year 81.2. So if I average those two, it's 78.8 .8 versus 62.9, okay? So in this rotation, this system, we get 62.9. In this system, our soybeans average 78.8. .8. So let's look what happens. With continuous corn, we have, we have a field that's been continuous corn, uh, 203 bushel corn, soybean 217, and this corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, the corn's better too, so we average 235. So that's better. So let's say if we had 5,000 acres of, of continuous corn, number one, you have to have 10, 10 combines and a bunch of semis and dryers and to harvest a million bushels of corn. But anyway, uh, we get a half a million bushels of corn and corn soybeans, 157,000 bushels of soybeans and, and no wheat. In this rotation, we don't get quite as much corn as we do in this one, but we get more beans on less acres. Here we would have 2,000 acres of soybeans give us 157,600 and, and here we would have uh, 2,500 acres of soybeans give us less soybeans. That's really an interesting number. And then we get this 1,200 bushels a week, 120,000 bushels a week. So <clears throat> if we look at this, would you trade seven? 72,500 bushels of corn for 120,000 bushels a week. That's really what you got to ask a guy from the Corn Belt. And the answer should be, I would. Plus, my <coughs> weed control costs are less. My insecticide costs are less. Right? Makes no sense for them to say we got to do corn soybean. They could feed it. For the cheapers they're producing that wheat, they could feed it instead of corn. <clears throat> anyway, I did the estimates of the difference in, in economics. And then in reality, they could only probably do 2,000 acres of continuous corn with the same equipment. They could do 4,000 acres of corn soybeans and 5,000 acres of this. And then a, a new rotation we just started with corn, corn, soybean, wheat. So it's, a, it's heavy on the corn yet, but it's... It's, it's lighter on the wheat. 
<clears throat> I've traveled some to Argentina. It's kind of interesting. Argentina is in the news again because they just had an election and they're going to start becoming a real country again, hopefully. But when I first went there, they were doing seven years of pastures and seven years of, of cropping. So they had a perennial, seven-year perennial that they grazed, and they produced lots of grass-fed beef, and they were a big thorn in our sides from a beef standpoint. And <clears throat> we went to a field. They used cover crops. This is a hairy vetch and rye cover crop going to beans. This is no cover crop here. And <clears throat> look at the soil structure. If you want to know what soil structure looks like, that's what it looks like. It just looks like chocolate cake and dark and whatever. And then they outlawed, they got this new leadership that just went out, but it's been there for a long time, and that new leadership outlawed the export of beef. And the idea, they said, was so that the poor people in Argentina could afford to buy beef, but in reality, we all know what happened is they switched from livestock production to all grain production and exported more. And the way that the government gets money in Argentina is they take 34% of the soybeans that hit the, mar hit the port go into the government's bins, okay? So they were trying to get more soybean production. So we went back in 2000, was there two years ago, was there four years ago, right? Whatever. But the last time, not the last time, but the time before that that I went back, we went to this exact same field. And <laughs> once they quit doing the pastures and start doing corn, soybeans, and mostly soybean, soybeans, in that same spot, look at the soil. And see that again? And it's probably, it probably took about 10 years for that to happen. I think I did this in 2006 when I took this. Organic matter makes a difference. Within all texture groups, organic matter increased from 1% to 3%. The available water holding capacity doubles. You're not short of moisture here. What you're short of here is water holding capacity of soils now. When your grandfather came here, your soils were way better than they are now and he produced better, relatively better crops and better grass on his pastures and stuff because it hasn't been degraded, okay? Um, when the soil storage capacity is low, much of the rain that falls during extended periods of precipitation, precipitation is lost. That's why we see more flooding in the, great, in the corn belt and stuff now because their soils are degraded and more runs off. If you had a bucket, it used to hold 10 inches, now it holds six. As soon as you get a rain, it's full. And they don't have the perennial in there to go down and take that deep water down to 12 feet out so that when you do get a wet year, it fills that 12 feet back up again. And the same thing kind of is true here. So we do a lot of stuff with cover crops. We call this catch and release nutrients. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people trying to get you hooked on doing some things with vertical tillage and all this kind of stuff. And <clears throat> I just made this slide up one day when I heard somebody talking about that. All tillage tools destroy soil structure, meaning the water don't go in the ground. So all tillage tools decrease water infiltration. All tillage tools reduce organic matter. They're burning up the organic matter. And all tillage tools stir the weeds around and increase weeds. We've got a lot of data that shows that too. Tillage is to agriculture, which fracking is to petroleum. What tillage did for our ancestors is they used it to get at all that stored nutrient that was put there over centuries and speed its decay, its availability to our crop. So they both increase the speed and extent of nutrient removal from a resource, leaving the resource degraded. They're plowing like this now in France, trying to get the last little bit of goody out of that soil. But there isn't a hell of a lot of goody left there, as you could tell by looking at it. It's just, it's amazing. Oh, <clears throat> and then they just pour a lot of stuff on. Continuous low disturbance no-till in combination of diverse rotation and cover crops is a biological answer to a biological problem. When I was in France, I got to visit one of my favorite people. It's a young Nuffeld scholar. We get these Nuffeld scholars from Europe and Australia and whatever, but they had, she was the first one from France. It's a British thing, and now they're branching out. Her name is Sarah Singla, and this is her farm. She no-tills. This is her grandfather who used to do used to do plowing, and so she had a picture of him plowing. She says he's looking backwards, and now her grandfather still does a lot of the seeding, looking forward. Thank you.
Don't get that chance very often for me to say that. <laughs> We're going to see next spring if there's a lot of difference in weeds. I'll repeat the question. Are, are the cows causing more weeds? Uh, there's two issues there. One is if they're stirring it. And we had absolutely no hoof damage other than, you know, and with our little squares, we're going to be able to tell exactly when we we're getting it, but probably getting just a little bit now, so we maybe we'll see some more weeds. The other way you'll get weeds with cattle is they'll have them in their rumen as they come in. It takes three, four days for that to, or in their hair or whatever, but in the rumen, that three or four days for them to clean out. And so we're doing some fecal, <coughs> excuse me, fecal sampling. I say we because I have a graduate student. When, <laughs> when you have to do things like fecal sampling, you say, we did this, and it was actually the graduate student that does it. <laughs> it's our dirty little secret. Uh, <laughs> but we're doing fecal sampling, and, and, and what's kind of happening is the ones that are on the continuous are running out of energy right now, which is kind of interesting. But they're also looking at weed seed stuff in there. And the ones that were moving every day, or every three days, they pick up quite a bit of energy that first day because nobody's been there before. And then, and then by the third day, they're starting to, starting to run out, but then we move them again. That's the reason for the three day. You can, you can give a cow protein once every three days and she's fine or whatever. That kind of stoke up the room. And, and then you're, you keep her from getting too stoked up too. And we didn't have enough that we got anybody sick from having them in the continuous stuff because I'm a better combine operator than that. But... Uh, and we didn't have any, any hybrids in that, in those fields that, that really blew off a lot of years, so. Yeah. You talked about your cover crops, in, and we run out of season to grow them. What have you done to make it so you grow them every year? You make it work every No, no, you don't make it work every, you, I grow them in the same sequences every year after wheat. We'll put them in there. But the idea is to try to start them before you harvest the wheat. If you can pick up, <clears throat> if you could get them started about the time the, the wheat um, goes to soft dough or between anthesis and soft dough, if you could actually start the cover crop then, then you don't have weeds. What happens is by the time you get to harvest, you have weeds starting. How do you put it down? Where, how do you introduce that seed so it starts Well, the seed ball. Yeah, and then you run, you run either your tram lines with a, a on, in wheat, you run your tram lines where you sprayed with your your ground sprayer and spread it with that, or you have an airplane. And and you know the airplane guys here aren't into this yet, but that's one of the things I think we can get them talked into. So we we have a lot of work going on right now with coat, seed coatings. We got we got a grant from Howard Buffett Foundation to do some things and. <coughs> You know, we were free to do whatever we wanted to, but that board of directors, and Bo used to be on the board of directors, so he knows my, our strategic plans and everything. He could tell you what they are, and one of them was livestock. Has been for a long time, and one was, was to do something with, you know, in making sure we can get these things to start. And it might be you're gonna, we're gonna plant them at the same time, and one thing has a delay on it, so crop A starts and crop B comes later, but right now we're looking at having something that makes them grow on top of the ground. Yes? What about, um, like, when we talk about this year, it was too late to get that cover crop going. What about, like, putting in an early crop like oats or even hay or deer, and you're able to come in with a cover crop, say, at the end of June or something like that? <clears throat> about that? Yeah, what about doing, actually, a double forage crop? And, and that's, that's, a, that's a slam dunk, that's an automatic. And, and for guys that are livestock people, and in one of those slides that flashed by, um, you know, livestock guys have a lot better opportunity to do these things because you do, you do have the opportunity to, to take that first crop off and, the, and then do a second crop. In, in, the, in the farm journal thing that we're, we're doing with Cronin's, which are, you know, just right basically straight across. Um, they were taking oats, 
oats and oats pea hay and baling it. And then what the plan was is to put those off on the edge of the field and plant uh, pearl millet and hay millet and, and cow peas and some of those things. And those got swaths, and swath grazing is really slick. If you, you, know, you want to come down and see what happened, it's, it's kind of good if there's anybody here doing it. Uh, and there's probably somebody on that panel this afternoon that does it. So, but with, they'd swath, and then they were planting uh, triticale between the swaths. So they took a 15-foot uh, John Deere drill and planted triticale when they swathed for the swath grazing. Then the plan was to p move the bales back out in lines across the field and use them to hold the p posts for the hot wire. And then all you have to do is just kind of move enough hot wire to it, and they'd have the oats bales, they'd have the hay millet and that kind of thing, and they'd have the growing triticale. And the only thing they did wrong is they <clears throat> hauled the bales home and didn't put up the hot wires, right? And it still worked fairly well, but they didn't have the, Dan Forge came down and he's on our board and he, <clears throat> we walked through where we're swath grazing, our swaths are all spread out and gone. So they're not, got those little piles in them. And theirs had the little piles because the cows would go here and then they go over there and then somebody poop on this one and then whatever, how, you know, how that goes. And, and <clears throat> so then he went home and he had all the guys come down and look at our swath grazing. So you have to go down there. So we'll see if there, that's enough of, in, you know, to inspire them to start doing some fans. But fencing is a pain in the butt. So that's why, you know, the, the self propelled grazing cell <clears throat> will have shelter, water, just be a big pin. It'll have shelter, it'll have water, it'll go move up and down the field, and we can call it up on our smartphones and look at our cows and, and you know. <clears throat> we have the technology to do all that now. But we prefer to put all our money into hauling crap to the house and hook back and whatever. You know, and, and, and you know, you're supposed to sit at home and listen to the radio instead of in the cab, other than your wife is there. See, it's a lot. <laughs> but do what I do, get your wife a job. <laughs> anyway. Okay.